I'm James Landay. I'm happy to introduce Jeff Hare from Stanford. He's an assistant professor there. Um, Jeff works in the areas of information visualization, human computer interaction, and social computing. Um, he's done quite well at Stanford. He's won a number of best paper awards in ACM uh, Chi Conference, InfoViz, um, and other venues. He's uh, won a Sloan Award, uh, MIT TR35. I don't know what else. Um, I'm actually also personally connected to Jeff. Uh, he reminded me that when he was a freshman at Berkeley as an undergraduate, where he also got his PhD, um, he was a freshman in 1997, and he was my freshman advisee, which I forgot. Um, <laughs> and he later did research for me, uh, with me as an undergrad, I should say. Or, uh, yeah, I would say Jeff, actually Jeff advised me, I'm sure. Um, he's done quite well. Uh, worked with Manisha Agrawal at Berkeley uh, for his PhD before going on to Stanford, and I think you really enjoy his talk. So go ahead, Jeff. All right. So thanks a lot, James. So I'd like to start this talk with a question. How much data do you think we, as a human society, produced in 2010? So go ahead and form your own mental estimate. And keep in mind this includes every video, every audio recording, every picture taken, every email sent, every tweet tweeted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just think about it. How much data do you think we're really producing? So it turns out one estimate for 2010 uh, is 1,200 exabytes. That's the same as 1.2 zettabytes, which is a number so large it sort of staggers the imagination. This is on the order of 10 to the 21 bytes. But to put that in perhaps a more useful perspective, this is over 60 million times the size of the Library of Congress. Or another way of thinking about it is you could take DVDs and stack them to the moon and back. And that's how much data we're talking about. And if you happen to think that's an interestingly large number, just wait. So this is growing about a 10x increase every five years. So if you think even a tiny fraction of this data is interesting, perhaps for informing governance, uh, you know, business, scientific research, we have a very interesting challenge in how we make sense of this data. And it's coming in a variety of sectors. So this includes physical sensing. In this image, we're actually seeing aggregated traces of GPS sensors and taxi cabs. But you can imagine the sensor installations that are going on for scientific research, or just what we're collecting in the cell phones in our own pockets. Another major driver of this data includes the health and medicine sector. So all of our healthcare records and physiological signals, probably very interesting data and perhaps prolonging our lives. And of course, every social and financial transaction that you engage in on the web is being logged, both the transactions themselves and then think about all the other systems logs that accompany all the, the workings of the computers in the world. And we have a very interesting and significant problem that I think is well summed by Google's chief economist, Hal Varian who wrote that the ability to understand, process, extract value, visualize, and communicate data is one of the most important skills we have to develop in the next decades, because we have essentially free and ubiquitous data, but the corresponding scarce factor is our own attention and our ability to make sense of this data. And so, of course, there are many areas of computer science that are engaged in this challenge, from storage architectures, database management, analysis algorithms, and all of these need to be marshaled to this task. And the piece of the puzzle that I'm most interested in is sort of the last mile in terms of how do people make sense of this data, and how do they marshal these resources to ask the questions that matter to society. And so one way I go about doing this is through visualization. And I'll talk a bit and let's talk about our research and how we try and create new visualization techniques and support others in that endeavor. But I think it's also important to recognize that visualization is just one piece of a much larger puzzle that includes thinking about how we acquire data, how we manipulate it, clean it, integrate it, engage in statistical modeling, and also visualize data and disseminate it. And unfortunately, too many of our tools assume a workflow that looks something like this. When anyone who's done data analysis knows that it tends to look much more like this. That intermediate products, they have a visualization, realize we have serious quality issues in our data and we have to go back and acquire new data, transform it in different ways. Or when we disseminate information, someone raises the question that undercuts the validity of our approach and we go back and engage in these iterative cycles that are characterized by many different human judgments throughout the process. And so towards that aim, here are some of the research questions that my group at Stanford has been trying to address. So first, how might we represent data to better facilitate reasoning? And this includes creating effective visualizations that leverage our perceptual systems to better reason about data. And given that knowledge, one, how can we design computer systems to allow us more, to more flexibly construct the appropriate representations? And then more generally, how do we engage in that life cycle of data analysis by assisting representational shifts through different models of data, visualizations, and statistical models as well? 
And so I'm going to use this sort of as a rubric for my talk. Um, and initially, we're going to start focusing kind of on the core area for me of visualization. And so let's start with another question. How do you think people create visualizations today? So if someone just make a wager, what is the single most popular tool for creating visualizations now? Excel. Right, so I would say Microsoft Excel or similarly spreadsheet software, I think we can agree, is probably the single most common way used uh, across the planet. And this is an instance of what we call a chart typology. That is, the visual encoding decisions have pretty much been made for us, and we just slot our data into it like a template. So in this case, we pick from a stock of templates. It has the advantage of being easy to use, but has obvious limits in terms of its expressiveness. And it really prohibits novel designs or the, the application of these methods to new data types. And so as a contrasting point, within the visualization, both information and scientific visualization fields, for about the last decade and a half, the most common approach to creating visualizations looks more like this. We have a component model architecture where we try and subdivide different aspects of the visualization process into recombinable operators. And so the idea is that hopefully you can solve recurring problems, but also address new challenges by having novel permutations of how we chain these operators together. Unfortunately, having built two frameworks that follow this general approach, I can tell you that novel designs typically require extending the software components. That is, you have to write new components that plug into these systems in order to achieve new designs or new data types. And this typically requires software engineering, so it tends to work well for programmers, but not for more general audiences. And so one of the research challenges we sought to address is how can we create a more flexible language for expressing visualizations? And so we were inspired uh, in, in this endeavor by a quote from John W. Tukey, the famous statistician. He wrote an article over 50 years ago, which is actually very prescient in many ways and holds true today. And he wrote that today's first task is not to invent wholly new graphical techniques, though these are needed, but rather we have most vitally to recognize and reorganize the essential of old techniques to make easy their assembly in new ways and to modify their appearances to fit new opportunities. And so this got us thinking about what is sort of a fundamental abstraction in which we can talk about the design of visualizations in a way that's broadly accessible. And so one of the insights we had inspired by Tukey was to think most simply about a graphic as a decomposition of data representative marks. So rather than thinking in a top-down manner about how we combine different high-level operators to construct a visualization, how can we specify the visualization in terms of the actual visual marks that we perceive? And how do we create a grammar for expressing visualizations that maps data uh, to these different elements? And so now what I'd like to do is give you uh, an idea of some of the things that we can create once we start building languages with this idea. So here's a classic visualization. Uh, this is from the, the 18th century, or so by William Playfair, who invented many of the different graphics that we've come to know today. It turns out over 200 years ago, someone actually had to invent the pie chart, and uh, William Playfair was just the man to do it. And one of the things that we thought about was, well, sure, we could try and recreate uh, common visualizations today, but that's not really the expressive barrier that we're reaching for. Rather, let's go back to when visualizations were drawn by hand and see if we have the requisite expressiveness to recreate those. So this is, of course, a, as a, a recreation of this famous chart showing the combination of the price of a mechanic, your wages, the price of wheat, uh, and also the reigning monarch in England at the time. Similarly, here's another classic visualization, this one due to Florence Nightingale showing uh, deaths in the Crimean War. In this case, what these blue sectors indicate is the number of preventable diseases that better hygiene, um, you know, those lives could have saved, uh, been saved. Of course, you know, from this point, we want to move on to more modern visualizations that support various levels of interactivity. Uh, but before we do that, we would not be complete unless we were able to recreate what Edward Tufte referred to as possibly the greatest statistical graphic ever made. I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, but in this case, what it's depicting is Napoleon's ill-fated march on Moscow, complete with a, a time series graph showing the temperature upon the army's retreat. Um, one of the things we want to do in bringing this type of visual expressiveness um, uh, to the modern age is also be able to mash this up with other technologies as well. So imagine, if you will, this, this graphic uh, with Google Maps underneath that actually allows you to zoom in and know that not only did the army march on Moscow, but they did not start in Paris, but rather that's actually in uh, modern day Latvia. And so moving on, we can look at interactive forms of representation as well. So here's kind of a similar overview plus detail display that allows you know, scrubbing of an overview to look at detailed data up close. We can also start to look at multivariate representations of data. This is a scatter plot matrix showing all pairwise projections of a data set. And we can combine this with interaction techniques, such as brushing and linking. So for example, I can drag out a region in one plot and then see how that selection of data projects across all the other dimensions in my data set. So for example, to understand clustering or projection across multiple dimensions. 
Another multivariate approach is parallel coordinates, which is instead of showing a scatter plot matrix, we take each dimension and plot it on a separate axis, and then draw a polyline that connects all points that are part of the same record. So in this case, we're looking at a database of cars. And so for example, I can use dynamic queries along one axis and see for all the cars that are heavy, I see that they have you know, faster acceleration. So this is you know, a, a lower time from zero to 60, um, but have poor fuel economy. And then I can drag and see how this data projects across all the other dimensions simultaneously. And this way, trying to aid multivariate reasoning. Looking at other examples as well, of course, geographic data is really common. In this case, we can see all the different airports in the United States, and then interactively query to see where they fly to. So in this case, you can see the network of connections between different airports. And if you're wondering you know, how I'm doing the selection, you notice that as I move the mouse cursor, the nearest element is automatically selected. That's because underneath we've done a Voronoi tessellation that allows us to pick uh, the nearest element, a uh, technique known as the bubble cursor. And then here's another representation. Uh, this shows uh, software dependencies within uh, a large software project. So each node here is a class, and they're grouped by package. And then you see all the different dependencies amongst those software modules. So for example, here I can see both incoming and outgoing dependencies for different units. And you'll notice also that the edges have been bundled to um, aid interpretation. So for example, I can go from a standard layout to actually bundling the spines along the package hierarchy of the code to understand not just individual dependencies, but also how dependencies group across different modules within the software. And finally, in addition to these interactive graphics, we'd also like to support uh, various forms of animation as well. And I apologize that the following is going to be a bit gratuitous, but it does give you a sense for the range of animated transitions we would like our languages to be able to support. And again, the idea is to be able to fluidly support shifts in the different representations so that as we move through different visualizations that allow us to you know, hone our attention on different aspects of the visualization, we can be able to fluidly move through this space. And again, it's, it, I apologize for being a bit gratuitous. Um, and so our first approach at this problem was a language that we call Protoviz. This is a declarative language for visualization specification. It was developed by my student Mike Bostock with help from Vadim Ogievetsky. And the basic idea of Protoviz is first, we want just a simple language for graphical marks. So what are the constituent elements, constituent elements of a visualization? And so here are the, the graphical primitives. This is the lexicon of marks we support. So this includes basic shapes, plotting symbols, raster images, and text labels. And then we want a way to specify visualizations in terms of these marks. So in this case, we actually, for each mark, there's a set of properties that can be bound to data in various ways. And so for those of you familiar with web programming, this is very similar to cascading style sheets, except we're taking style sheets and turning them into an object for functional programming. And so for any of these different uh, mark properties, such as the visibility or the position or the color of a mark, we can either set a constant or make it a function that maps from data to the appropriate visual range. So for example, let's try and create a simplistic bar chart. So here's what we do. You see that we have input data, which is just an array of elements. Uh, for most of the properties, we can set them to simple con uh, constants. And then for the dynamic properties, we can define uh, anonymous functions. In this case, that sets the left edge of the bar based on an index into the data array, and then the height of the bar based on the data value. So for example, what we've done here is also, in a declarative way, um, encapsulate the control flow. So in this case, uh, this, uh, we'll stamp out visualizations just by iterating through the different data elements, which in turn generates the marks that are displayed in the visualization. And so then what we do is with that abstract model, we can then realize this language in a variety of programming languages. So for example, this is what it looks like in JavaScript, where we're using the web browser to then generate these visualizations as scalable vector graphics or SVG. Of course, all we've done here is create a simple bar chart. And while I would argue that 90% of the time a bar chart is the right visualization to use, keep that in mind, we of course want to be able to create more expressive designs as well. So for example, we're able to create uh, Napoleon's March in about half a page of code. And so in addition to these concise specifications, we also include other language features such as a standard library of standard scales and layouts, and also inheritance among different mark types uh, to make the specification more concise. So in this way, we hopefully have a very intuitive model for specifying graphics with a high expressive ceiling. And so because we implemented this as a declarative, embedded, domain-specific language, we're also able to inherit many of the benefits that come from well-designed DSLs. So this includes productivity. So for example, we compared uh, development in Protoviz with other leading toolkits and found that we typically found about five times less code with 10 times less development time. 
often by getting rid of control flow and having unnecessary abstractions moved out of the way. People were to reason directly in terms of the graphical marks, which made it easier for them to realize their vision. Uh, we also get benefits with portabil portability, because we had this high-level design. We've actually been able to implement it for multiple platforms. Our flagship implementation was in JavaScript, but we did versions for Adobe Flash and for the JVM as well. And with the JVM, we also had the option of exploring the other uh, benefit of DSLs, which is performance. Because we have this high-level declarative specification, we can actually go in and optimize the performance in a way that's unobtrusive to users writing the code. So this includes looking at things like just-in-time compilation of the visual encoding specification, parallel execution of various parts of the visualization pipeline, and also taking advantage of hardware accelerated rendering. So to give you a sense of the benefits this provides, you know, here's one of the benchmarks we ran, which is interactive graph layout. Where we you know, uh, compute the layout for a force-directed layout of a network. We varied the number of nodes and edges on a logarithmic scale here, so basically increasing by an order of magnitude uh, from left to right, and then measured the frames per second you know, in the layout time for this graph. And so here we've compared our uh, Protoviz Java implementation uh, to Prefuse, uh, which is a bit unfair because I'm comparing to my own prior work, but it was the leading uh, software visualization framework in Java. So we did this, and you do see that we get a 20 times scalability improvement, which means I can now visualize networks that are 20 times larger with the same frame rate as what people were able to do before, while still being able to write this visualization in 10 times uh, less time. So unfortunately, we're not able to achieve similar performance benefits in the web browser for a number of reasons. And so this led us to a, a new language that was based on our, our uh, findings with Protoviz, and it's called D3, and that stands for Data-Driven Documents. And the most primary difference between D3 and Protoviz was that instead of making visualizations in terms of this lexicon of graphical marks, we instead bind data directly to the document object model within the web browser. So in this case, you take input data and bind it to HTML or SVG elements directly, and by doing this, we're able to cut out the middleman of an intermediate abstraction and get a big performance benefit but also by, by speaking the representation that the browser naturally uses, we also removed an expressiveness ceiling in the tool, is that as browser vendors add new features, our language can take advantage of them automatically because we speak directly in terms of browser abstractions. And so we've released this as open source software. Um, so you can go download this or Protoviz or any of our tools. Um, and one of the things that's been great about this is engaging in the open source community where we have a large and active community of developers. And indeed, um, it's been used widely by industry and by academia to the point where now D3 is the 27th most popular project on GitHub. So we've had a lot of fun watching uh, different developers create uh, interesting and creative applications of their own. It's also become sort of a prerequisite for many job positions in both the data science and uh, user, user interface development, um, including, it turns out, uh, jobs here at University of Washington as well. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that's been really engaging is to watch people and you know, really respected professionals pick up and do interesting things with these tools as well. So for example, here's a, uh, from, from journalism, here's the Washington Post visualizing campaign finance data using Protoviz. And recently you may have seen this, uh, the New York Times used D3 to create a, a suite of visualizations uh, slicing and dicing President Obama's budget proposal. And in addition, professional design firms have been picking up this tool as well. So this is from my colleagues at Stamen Design, and what you're seeing is the backdrop from the MTV Music Video Awards, uh, and all these visualizations, both uh, on-premises and online, were driven by D3. And when we started this project, we were thinking about you know, data analysts and scientific research. I had no idea that our tools would also be used to provide Lady Gaga's Twitter tracker. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in summary, we've been you know, very excited to watch you know, our visualization tools be able to reach uh, millions of end users and help foster a development community over tens of thousands of visualization designers. Um, and we think part of the, the way this has been successful is by finding that right language design that enables both expressivity and performance. So this answers a bit of the question I raised at the beginning about how can we create visualizations more flexibly. Uh, but I've done a bit of a bait and switch in that I haven't talked about, well, what makes visualizations effective? And so that's another area of research that we actively pursue. So for example, we've um, turned to using crowdsourcing methods as basically a virtual laboratory for graphical perception experiments. And what you're seeing here is the results from online experiments in which people compare values under different visual encodings, such as uh, position, uh, length, angle, area, et cetera. And we're actually able to quantify how accurate people are with these different visual encodings, which both provides design guidelines and serves as you know, rankings that help inform automated design procedures. 
More recently, we've also been exploring uh, models of human color perception, and particularly the mapping between color names and perceived color stimuli. And it turns out, uh, both through our own experiments and through prior psychological literature, the way in which people name colors has interesting implications for both what is remembered and people's ability to communicate about what they're seeing. And so by building a model between color perception and linguistic labeling, we're actually able to quantify a number of different design choices one might make with color. And this is leading into new algorithms for automated color palette optimization. And finally, in this space, we've also been exploring computational models of graphical perception. And this is with colleagues in computer vision. So for example, I can take a bitmap image of a chart. And then given that, I can then use machine learning methods to classify the chart type. So basically things like pie chart, line chart, bar chart, et cetera. And then based on that classification, we employ a number of custom written extraction rules to recover the underlying data set. And by doing this, one, we might be able to reuse this data, but we can also create new, better visualizations. So in this case, this pie chart uses some highly saturated colors. Thin slices make it difficult to compare small differences in value. So we automatically generate a gallery of redesigned visualizations, including this sorted bar chart that makes it much easier to see small differences among data elements. So these are just some of the ways in which we're trying to explore how to create visualizations more efficiently and also understand what it means to design more effective visualizations in practice. That's a bit about visualization, but now I'd like to take a slightly lar larger look and think about going beyond visualization, how else can we support this larger process of analysis? And so what I'd like to talk about now is one project where we're looking earlier in the data life cycle and thinking about, well, how do we engage in data cleaning and visualization to really advance analysis uh, more effectively? So let's start by looking at some actual data. Uh, this is from the US government, Bureau of Justice, and their statistics department. This shows a, show housing crime data from a number of different states within the US. And it's actually, by and large, a fairly clean data set. And, you know, it's well structured. You can probably make sense of it quite quickly. Um, but I challenge you to load this into any database tool, um, statistics packages like R, visualization tools like Tableau, and you'll find that it will break upon import. In fact, it's probably a very common experience for many of you that lots of effort is involved in transforming, cleaning, and manipulating data prior to be able to perform analysis on it. And in fact, we're conducting a broad survey interviewing uh, different analysts in 25 different companies. And this is a very representative quote. Where one of our respondents said, I spend more than half of my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. And indeed, our prior surveys have found that up to 80% of the time and cost involved in big data warehousing projects involves around issues of data cleansing, transformation, and integration. And this is certainly true in visualization as well. The only problem is that we don't really talk about it. We publish papers on new visualization techniques and systems and ignore the much larger percentage of work that went into acquiring and preparing the data. And so I see these issues of data manipulation as something of the elephant in the room of visualization research. And so, of course, others have looked at this in statistics and databases. Issues of data cleaning and transformation are a longstanding issue, and there are many valuable algorithms that we can apply to this task. Our goal was to understand how can we build better interfaces that really put those algorithms to work for people. And so that led us to building a system that we call Data Wrangler. And this was primarily done by my PhD student, Sean Kendall, along with a number of other collaborators. So let me jump right in and give you a demo of what Data Wrangler is. So let's start with a simplified version of that housing crime data we looked at earlier. So in this case, we can load it into the tool and click Wrangle. And then we're brought into an interface where we can manipulate the data further. And already, the system's made a couple of decisions on our behalf. So you can see a transformation script in the bottom left where we split the data on new lines. And also, we saw a common delimiter, a comma. So we split the data based on that. And now what we'd like to do is transform this data so we can load it into a statistics or database tool. So for example, I can click this empty row here because I'd like to delete them. And then you see as I click that element, I get a number of suggestions of possible operations I might perform. So the simplest thing is to just delete the row that I've selected. But you see that it's done some inference as well. It sees that that row is empty, so I can instead you know, delete all the empty rows. So I do that, and you'll notice that in red, I get a visual preview of what that operation will do. I hit return and I execute that. Now what I would like to do is associate the state name with each individual record. So to do that, I can go in and just select the text associated with that record. Look at that. Um, and now you see that it's made a number of inferences, including you know, extracting based on position within the string. 
And we can see this fails because that index exceeds what's possible for Alaska, so we get an empty value there. So what I can do is give it more examples so it can generalize its inference. And now you see it's found a regular expression that defines what I want. And I can visually preview that this is the right thing. So now I've extracted the state names, but I'd like to associate them with the records. You might notice that above each column, there's this sort of uh, meter. And this is the number of values that parse according to an inferred type. And in here in gray, we see all the missing values. So if I click this gray bar, it gives me suggestions of things I can do with missing data. And that might be deletion, or I can do interpolation. In this case, I'll copy all those values down to fill out the column. Now I'd like to get rid of these extraneous rows uh, with reported crime in. And there's a number of things I could do. I, Wrangler figured out that most of the values in this first column are numbers. So it flags these strings as type errors. And so I could select by that error status. Similarly, I could select all the missing values in the column on the right. But making operations based on those criteria could be error prone. So instead, what I'm going to do is select the text reported crime in. And I want to delete rows where that text appears. And I can even give the system a hint, let it know I want deletion operators. So that changes the suggestions I receive. And here you see that indeed it found the predicate that I want. So I execute that. And now I have this data, which is relatively nicely formatted. And this is something I could export and load into my database. But at this point, you might have also noted that there's a couple suggestions that appeared on the left automatically. And it turns out many times I want to be able to reshape data as well. So if in this case I wanted to bring it into Excel, I might uh, prefer a cross-tabulation format similar to pivoting. So in this case, is a possible reshape operator, which is because it's dramatically restructuring the shape of the table, I show the preview in the terms of a before and an after view. Um, but in this case, let's say, let's skip that and go back to this nice relational format and say that's what we want to export. So to do that, I click the export button. And sure enough, I can export the sample of data that I manipulated, whether it's in comma-separated values, tab-separated values, you know, JSON for web-based formats. But in the process of wrangling this data, I wasn't just manipulating data. As shown in the script down here, I'm actually creating a program in a high-level language. And so what I can do instead is actually not generate you know, the transformed data, but generate the program that will transform that data at scale. So here it is, you know, output is Python code that I can then run on my server, maybe to transform much larger data sets. So in this way, I'm trying to create a bridge between what I can do in the interface and be able to interface with large data stores. So let's review quickly what I've just shown in the demo. So Wrangler really consists of two parts. Underlying that interface is a declarative data transformation language. This is a declarative language for various types of data manipulation, including splitting, merging, extracting, deleting values within records. Reshaping tables, for example, to form cross tabulations, doing lookups based on types. You notice we inferred various types throughout the process, as well as standard sorting and aggregation operators. And to do this, we drew on a past research in the database field, including uh, systems such as Potter's Wheel, languages such as Schema SQL, and systems like Ajax. So we used that as a starting point and then iteratively um, designed our language along with the development of the user interface. So then on top of this language is a mixed initiative interface for data transformation. And as you saw, a user can select elements of interest, and in response, the system suggests applicable transforms, things that think you might want to do to get the data into a more usable state. And the idea is to make this dialogue very rapid by supporting previews and refinements. So, and indeed, those visual previews are what users primarily use to navigate the space of transformations. So let me give you a little more insight into how this transformation suggestion works. So as you saw, the first thing that happens is that users interact with the system, whether by selecting text, clicking rows, columns, et cetera. The next operation is to infer operands. That is basically, from that selection, we're going to infer parameters that then can be used by operators within our declarative language. And so this includes things like text highlights, map to row, column and text selections, um, as well as doing uh, you know, simple inferences, as well as more complex regular expression inference. So let me give you a sketch of how that works in particular. So assume I have text that looks like this sitting in a cell. There might be various ways I'd like to split or extract data from it. And so before the user makes a selection, we actually tokenize strings like this into a suddenly generalized representation. So things like the beginning of the string, string, white space, string, symbols, numbers, et cetera. So we basically do a slightly higher level characterization of the token stream here. And then assume the user makes a selection. In this case, say so they drag over the NLU 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, et cetera. Then the system does a number of things in response. So first, it does simple inferences like match on the string indices, which in some cases is what you want. And then it also tries to iterate over a variety of patterns that might uh, match this selection. So it might you know, match the token directly. 
or it can start to generalize more interesting patterns. Like by iterating through, enumerating the space of possible mappings between both the original source text and this higher level representation, we can do things like all instances of LNU number. And these are direct matches. We also uh, search both before and after the selected string to look for matches in terms of things that might have occurred before or after in the data. And then from this, we can just enumerate all these patterns um, and keep the ones that work. So that gives us a set of operands. And once we do that, we then generate all transforms that can accept those operands as input. We also have some heuristics for filtering out no ops, and we set unmatched parameters to default values. And when we've done this, we've generated a large number of possible transformations, so we submit this to a ranking algorithm. Um, and this is uh, driven by a number of things. We have our own internal metric of specification difficulty. We also have a corpus of transformations so that more probable things are surfaced. And we also allow user interaction to uh, shift the ranking. So for example, if I click an element in the toolbar, I will uh, prioritize uh, rankings of that, uh, transforms of that type. And at the end of this process, I then simply present the top end in the user interface. And so that's how I end up with these transforms that you saw in the application. So next we wanted to know, well, how well does this tool work? So what we started with was doing a comparison with Excel, which is certainly the most widely used data manipulation tool in the world today. And we actually did the comparison with a very small data set. In no case did it exceed 30 values. And the idea was, well, can we work where the manual transformation is actually feasible? Do we still get benefits then? So what we did in our evaluation was test three different common data cleaning tasks. So extracting individual elements from strings, imputing missing values, and also performing table reshaping operations. Um, and so then we measured user task study completion time for both Wrangler and Excel within a within subjects design. And then here's our results. Um, and what we found was that in all cases, the medium completion time for Wrangler was at least twice as fast as Excel. And this was pretty exciting because, again, this was with very small data sets. So you can imagine the how the benefits compound when we deal with much larger data sets. So that even when manual manipulation is completely feasible, we're still over twice as fast as, as Excel. In the process, we also observed how people use the Wrangler tool. Indeed, found that suggestions and visual previews were used heavily, and that primarily people use the visual previews to navigate uh, through the transformation space. However, we're also able to observe the types of transforms that cause people difficulty. And as you may have surmised by looking at this data, in the reshape task, we have a number of outliers where people performed rather poorly. And that's because people found it difficult both to specify and to think about tasks that reshape the entire table. So for example, if I start with a table like this, one possible operation is to convert the boys and girls columns to name value pairs like this. This is an operation that we call a fold. And of course, we can do the inverse, which is similar to pivoting, which is an unfold. And again, people found this quite difficult to do. But interestingly enough, these are the type of transforms that are actually quite easy to recognize and apply automatically. So this got us thinking about ways in which, in addition to user-initiated transforms, we might also automatically suggest transforms on behalf of the user. So this is part of the continuing research that we're undergoing. Uh, it's like, how do we support better proactive transform suggestion? And for this, we assume that users want to reach a relational table, because indeed, this seems to be the primary use case that we observed. And so to do this, we wanted to create an optimization criterion that we might um, use to drive some of this automated design. So this is our formula. Um, what you see here, C and R, refer to the row and column sets. And here we have basically simple terms for the number of empty cells, or the number of common delimiters within a, a cell, and then also a measure of type homogeneity. So are all the values of the same type, or are they quite different? And then doing this, we create a score of table quality. Zero is basically perfect according to this metric, and higher values mean tables that are further and further from the ideal of a relational table. And so even using this simple metric, we're able to uh, suggest transforms more effectively. So for example, to evaluate this, we actually compared automatic versus manual transformations. So what we did was we collected a large corpus of data sets and then manually transformed each one into a proper relational data table. We then basically play back that analysis process and each time see what suggestions our search algorithm makes using that metric I just discussed, and then we compare the results. And what it turns out is from this, we're actually able to suggest over 53% of the transforms uh, which is actually better than it might look at first, because what happens is we purposefully avoid transformations that delete data. We don't want to automatically delete data. We want users to make that decision. And also, given the large combinatorial space, we actually avoid doing string extraction rules. And so basically, all the other transform types then get covered uh, by this metric. And so indeed, in the cases where we do make a, a suggestion, those 53%, uh, we have pretty high precision. That is, the top rank suggestion is the correct one 70% of the time, and the mean rank of that uh, recommendation is 1.6. So 
what you see is that in addition to be able to manipulate the data directly, our tool also gives these proactive suggestions on the side that we've found in all cases allows them to jump ahead in terms of fold and unfold transformations that are reshaping the table. So that's one of the areas that we're continuing to explore. What we're doing with this now is just a single look ahead within the transformation steps. Future work can look at more sophisticated search algorithms that maybe attempt to suggest multi-step transforms as people manipulate data. In addition, we're also looking at how to make this scale more effectively. We've already written implementations of the Wrangle DSL in both SQL and Hadoop for running on MapReduce clusters. And now we've hooked up the system together and we're in the process of exploring what sorts of user interactions allow this to work. So you might pull a sample out of a very large database, wrangle it, and everything looks fine, and then you send the script back to run at scale on your cluster. Now it's very likely that a number of errors will arise in that process that just weren't predicted by your sample. So how do you cluster those results that are coming back and present them to a user in a way that allows them to actually work with this data at scale is one of the primary ongoing projects that we're dealing with now. We also have the issue that as you're adding structure to this data, we can then begin to engage in more advanced visual analytics or visual profiling. For example, moving forward with other aspects of data quality assessment. So things like detecting anomalies and helping people visualize the data in useful ways. And so for that, we've built an add-on to Wrangler that we call Profiler. And the idea is that at the end of uh, doing some wrangling, you then have you know, a relational data set with variables, and here we're able to infer the underlying data types. And then we use that to feed these data into a bank of standard anomaly detectors. So for things like missing data, uh, extreme values, type errors, um, you know, key violations, things of that sort, that we can then automatically flag in this browser. So then what users can do is then, if they choose, to look at the suggested anomalies. So in this case, we're actually looking at a database of movies. And it turns out the MPAA rating, so things like G, PG, PG-13, has the highest proportion of missing values. So we might then want to ask why. You know, this, will this affect my analysis? So if I click that, I then get a visualization of that, that data field. So in this case, a simple histogram, along with a quality meter that shows me the number of valid values versus the number of missing values. But in addition, what we would like to do is suggest other variables in the data set that may help explain or make sense of that observed anomaly. So then what we do is actually search over both all the other variables in the data set, as well as possible binning strategies using a similarity metric based on the mutual information between the predicted anomaly and the distributions within the other columns. And then using that similarity function as, as a ranking measure, we then present the visualizations that we think are most likely to explain this anomaly. So then, for example, I can click this missing data value region here and then engage in a linked selection that it projects those missing values across all the other attributes within the data set. In doing that, we see the top ranked suggestion release date um, has a high correlation with these missing values. And in particular, the, the ratings did not go into effect, I believe, until around 1970. So now, unsurprisingly, with that additional context, we see that most of those missing values are due to the fact that for those movies, the MPA rating system didn't even exist. So in this way, what we're trying to do is take some automated statistical processing that flags possible issues and then use automated view suggestion to try and help people understand um, how those outliers or those errors came about and whether or not they're an impediment to further analysis. So that's some of our ongoing work on data profiling. And then finally, we're also interested in wrangling interfaces for other data types. So right now I focus primarily on tabular data. As you imagine, there are many other types of data that we would like to analyze as well, including networks and text. And as we move in this direction, it forces us to increase our scope, not just from cleaning and visualization, but really engaging in integration of multiple data sets and engaging in statistical modeling as well. So uh, as I wrap up this talk, I'd like to give you some examples of projects that we're doing in this space. And so the first is in the area of networks. So we built a tool called Orion, which is in many ways like Wrangler, but really designed to help people create models of networks, such as social networks, analyze them, and create visualizations thereof. So what you might have as input is a variety of different tables. So in this case, we have stuff from the ACM Publications database. Our tool includes algorithms for automated key inference. We can figure out foreign key relationships among tables. And then we create a backing data structure that allows us to do search over possible joining paths that might link these data sets together to create networks. So for example, if I'm interested in a social network of authors, then the system can actually query this graph and then return back possible networks um, that realize that social network, in this case, one in which authors are linked together by being co-authors on a publication. And then we can run any number of batch statistics or visualization techniques over that data. In this case, for example, looking at a matrix display of uh, co-authorship. Um, also, we've been looking at new ways of representing networks. 
Um, so for example, graph prism is a technique for massively scalable network visualization. And the idea is that things like node link diagrams or matrices just have inherent scalability limits. We want to see can we visualize million or billion element networks by forms of statistical summarization. So what you're seeing on the left, each is a multi-scale histogram of some various graph statistic computed over different ranges within the network. So for example, we might take something like degree or you know, transitivity, which you might know as clustering coefficient or conductance. We first compute that in the area of a single node, and then we can compute these statistics over expanding radii within the graph. And this corresponds to these different levels in these histograms. And in doing so, we're actually able to create a visual thumbprint, visual fingerprint of structural features of the graph along multiple scales. And so while it's a quite abstract visualization in user studies, we found that people are actually able to use this to find interesting structural patterns on graphs that are otherwise quite difficult to visualize. We've also been very interested in exploring ways to visualize and analyze text as well. So this is a system called the Stanford Dissertation Browser, as done with uh, my PhD student Jason Chuang. And the idea was to look at the shifting similarities among academic departments over two decades of Stanford PhD theses. The idea was to compute the similarity between different academic departments and then shift how those, and visualize how those uh, differences shift over time. And one of the interesting things that we found here is we initially thought we would take methods coming out of our collaborators in natural language processing and then design a visualization that effectively showed those. And we thought we'd spend some time iterating on the visualization, but instead what happened was we quickly converged on the visualization that showed us that the underlying models were wrong. So for example, we looked at similarity based on TF-IDF cosine scores, kind of a standard approach. We also computed uh, latent topic models and compared topical composition. Uh, this had the unfortunate effect of collapsing all the humanities into a single element, uh, which was both wrong and politically incorrect. Um, <laughs> So this caused us to actually take a different tack, which is how can we design both the model and a visualization together? So we brought in experts, in this case Stanford professors, to go in and document all the cases in which they thought the model was an error. And in the process of doing this, we realized we had made one flawed assumption, which is we assumed that the distance between departments, like a good mathematical distance metric, should be symmetric. And it turns out that's not true. Um, so for example, in one year, the music department had a number of computer music theses, and it was very you know, just feasible to say in that year, the music department was very similar to CS. But there were no music dissertations whatsoever in CS, and so no one would claim the, the opposite. So we actually used the machinery of, of supervised topic modeling to create a new asymmetric similarity score that had much better fit with expert judgments. So this is one of the examples in which we're trying to understand not just the visualization, but how visualization analysis go hand in hand to make these tools responsive to people's real world analysis tasks. And more recently, we've been looking at other tools to try and make a statistical topic model, such as latent Dirichlet allocation, or LDA, more effective. So this is screenshots from a tool we just published called Termite, which is a topic model viewer that in this case shows uh, the word topic distributions um, that are learned by some of these statistical modeling frameworks. And we include elements for you know, smartly seriating or sorting the rows and columns of the matrix to unleash patterns, and also new metrics for picking out distinctive terms that best show the differences and helping distinguish between different topics that are found by the algorithm. And so in this way, we see this as a first step in helping people do wrangling, not just on source data, but really wrangling with the outputs of statistical models. Is that in the literature, you'll see that most people who use statistical topic models for real world analyses end up deleting topics, reseeding words, adding new stop words, merging topics together. And so we want to support both the verification of the models and the subsequent manipulations that make these models more responsive to real world analysis. So, Hopefully in the course of this talk, I've given you some sense of the interesting research problems that lie at the intersection of databases, analysis algorithms, and visualization in helping make analysis both more accessible to a broader audience, but also making experts more efficient. And so throughout this pipeline, we are identifying a number of interesting bottlenecks in the analysis process and developing new visualizations and interfaces for helping make analysts more effective. Um, so that I'd also like to thank our various funders, including the Boeing Company, Greenplum, Intel, various funding agencies, and also, of course, uh, the people who are really responsible for this work, uh, the many students and collaborators within the Stanford Visualization Group. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and take any questions you have. And should you be interested in any of the papers or software, much of which we make open source, you can find it online at viz.stanford.edu. So thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. You talked about uh, embedded domain-specific languages. Um, 
So I, I used to work on constraints a lot, and I noticed you know you have little uh, functions here. What if you had more general kinds of constraints? What could you do with your visualizations of your language? So let me see. So the question was, what could we do by adding constraints into these languages? So one thing I'll note is uh, by using this kind of functional programming approach to the domain-specific language, we have lots of library routines that can plug in things as simple as excuse me, linear and logarithmic scales, or like cartographic projections, et cetera. We also have various layout algorithms, including force-directed layout, that we actually solve using a constraint solver. So the thing is, you basically, if you have a, a scheme for layout that you can encode and basically calculate in data space, and then the results of that calculation can then plug right in into these visual specifications. And so we, we actually do a degree of that already. And interestingly enough, uh, some of the contributors uh, to the open source project are actually wanting to contribute constraint solvers to aid with other sort of meta issues in layout. So if I want to have a, a chart that might vary in size and I want to add labels, you know, axis labels, et cetera, around that chart, they want to add uh, some constraint solvers to add, like, you know, not just the layout within the visualization, but then guiding the layout of multiple visualizations or the various components that decorate a visualization. Yeah, James. So I'm curious, um, you know, some of your tools have, uh, started really as a declarative language and try to uh, make access to visualization to uh, the non-professional programmer mm -hmm. audience. I'm wondering, you know, at what level do you start to run into a ceiling um, for those tools as well as can the floor be lowered in terms of making more interactive tools? Absolutely. Kind of like what you've done with Data Wrangler for mm -hmm. someone who's not going to program at all. And, you know, and there are tools commercially, but yeah. kind of where is the space going there? Right. So, so the question is really kind of a classic UI toolkit issue of floor and ceiling, and what do these approaches enable? Um, so you'll see a recurring design pattern across these projects. So one is trying to understand the domain and create a do domain-specific language that really encapsulates uh, the operations people want to do. In the case of Wrangler, we then combine that with a user interface for making statements in that language. Um, we plan to do the same thing uh, with Protoviz. We just haven't gone there yet. So one of the next stages in future work is we think that model of thinking in terms of you know, mapping data to graphical marks can actually be expressed in a way that minimizes the programming. You may still have to write some, some equations or pick some scales, but we think a similar sort of graphical environment, what we call a VDE or visualization development environment, can be developed to make statements in that language graphically. And one of the things I think is exciting is that, like, just as we have autocomplete and grammar correction within word processors, um, taking some of these other ideas on automated visualization design and surfacing them within the tool, much like we do you know, suggestion of transformations within Wrangler, is a component we plan to explore as part of that research. And so the goal there is hopefully to preserve the expressive ceiling that we've already established, but really open up uh, the field so that people who aren't JavaScript programmers, for example, can build similarly complex and interesting visualizations. Yeah, Steven. So I'm curious to what, I mean, you talked a lot about um, making things easier for people who want to do analysis, you know, who are probably used to doing visualization tasks. I'm curious to what extent do you think we're all going to be using visualization tools uh, in sort of from day-to-day -day basis um, and, and in which ways? So I think it's going to happen in many different ways. One, we already are. Um, if, you just, if, you, if you're a reader of the New York Times, you already are, or the Washington Post. So even within journalism, the adoption of visualization has been quite high. In terms of analysis, that's already the common approach. So certainly even things like MATLAB and R have you know, extensive plotting capabilities that people are using. I think what's going to be interesting and develop further is, one, the, the use of visualization in conjunction with modeling is going to get much richer. Um, certainly an interesting and valuable example is just verifying model outputs. I also think there's a whole range of uh, visual analytic tools that allow rapid exploration of graphs in a non-programming manner. Many of you are familiar with tools like Tableau that already support this in some form. And we're already seeing now with the explosion of investment in analytics companies, certainly that's all the buzz in Silicon Valley right now, people are building a variety of tools of that nature, um, primarily in a, a web-based uh, fashion using our tools. And so I expect over the coming years that they can be an increasingly common opponent, component of all like, major analytic packages. I'm not sure I answered your question. So, so I guess, right, but I get I don't see myself as a user of major analytical yeah. analytic packages. You know, like sure. I read email, I write PowerPoint presentations or whatever. So so yeah. I, just sort of more kind of end user day to day tasks where yeah. you see. So, so I should know, you know, along those lines actually Protoviz is shipping with it's part of Mozilla Thunderbird. So if you do want to visualize your email, you can use Thunderbird and write Protoviz scripts in that. So that, that was nice because Mozilla gave us a, a locked-in user base, I think about 25 million users with that one. Um, 
But so more generally, what our, my main point is, you know, there are a million different domains I could conjure up that would be interesting to explore. Some of them which we do explore because I see it driving more fundamental research questions and visualization. But the larger goal in building these tools is to enable people, whether it's you or your student or someone else who has that idea, is interested in it, giving them the tools so they can do it themselves. And that's one of the primary thing I'd like to enable through this research, allowing people to do that more effectively. Okay, if there's no more questions, we can wrap up and uh, Jeff will hang around for a few minutes if you have Great. questions. Thank, Thank you very you. much.